Friday, April 19th, 2024, Maneco 64, Home of Alternative Economics and Contrarian Views. So today I have the pleasure of having Clive back. Uh, Clive, uh, prior to uh, my uh, uh, travails in hospital, we've been doing uh, pretty regular uh, Friday uh, chats. So nice to see you again, Clive. How are you? Um, hello, Mario. Thank you very much for having me back on your show. And I'm very pleased that your hospital operation went okay. And it's good to see you back uh, broadcasting every day. So that's great news. Thank you. So we're, in for a nervous, we're in for a nervous weekend, aren't we, Mario? What's going on? Yeah, I, I mean, I was telling you before we came on air that I got up in the middle of the night to go for a, uh, you know, what you do at night sometimes, uh, a toilet break. And, and I looked at my uh, trading app. Because I do that sometimes, and I saw that the Dow was down 400, gold was uh, like at 2412, the spot price. Silver was almost at 29, and I thought, oh, I need to see what's going on. And I looked, and supposedly uh, Israel had uh, hit uh, Israeli missiles had hit Iran, uh, a city of uh, called Isfahan, where they have. A, a lot of their nuclear facilities. But funnily enough, um, you know, Israeli and U.S. officials are confirming this, but the Iranians are denying it. So I, I'm not too sure, you know, that there's that old saying that in times of war, uh, the first victim is the truth. So <laughs> well, is it always the case that we're getting two sides to the story, uh, depending on who you're listening to? And, you know, I, I think the the reality here is you can't really trust any media. Uh, you have to make your own judgment of, of what's going on, because uh, even the I mean, I'm finding even mainstream trustworthy sources are getting into the habit of uh, Broadcasting things that they've read somewhere on Twitter, which has been put out by somebody without with who, who's got no reputation. So, uh, I th yeah, let's just be careful because we're going to get two stories on this, and, and the truth will only come out slowly and surely uh, over time. Yeah, but uh, I, I, the ball. Uh, I mean, after what's happened, I think the ball is now in Iran's court, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's almost like they're trying to uh, maybe. <laughs> Not maybe the the uh, Israelis are trying to trap them and force them to like respond. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing that's happened though, it's created quite a bit of volatility in the markets uh, because the Dow is now down only 137, and, and earlier it was down uh, well over almost 500 points, and gold got up to 24.18 and is now at 23.89, which is still a, a good level. And, and silver as well got up to 28.96 and it's now at 28.43. So uh, I know you follow, uh, you like gold and silver, but you, you follow other things. And before we came on, I was telling you that I had looked at, uh, uh, for example, the Dow, S&P and NASDAQ that and that year to date, you know, the Dow is almost virtually unchanged. It's up like a, a quarter of a percent. That's uh, as of yesterday. Uh, the S&P is up five and the NASDAQ is up like 3.93%. And even the Russell small cap 2000, that's down 4%. And if you look at uh, gold, for example, in dollars, it's up about 16% year to date. In pounds, it's about 18 and a half. And in the euros is up almost twenty percent. So, what do you think is happening here uh, in terms of uh, these uh, performances in, in these different asset classes? And what do you think it tells you going forward? If we look back over the last year, we saw a very large rise in technology stocks. Uh, they're known as the Mag Seven or the Magnificent Seven. Uh, I, I haven't got them all in my head, but they're companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla. Uh, Meta, which is Facebook, um, and and Nvidia, of course. Uh, there's a couple more which I can't haven't got in my head. Now Alphabet, those stocks have performed. Alphabet, I guess Google. Yes, yes, that's it. Alphabet, uh, probably one other. Um, those stocks have performed amazingly well, and there's a debate as to whether the valuations are have gone too far 
or whether the growth of these companies in the future uh, justifies those very high valuations. Now, those stocks have come off quite a lot in the last few weeks. Um, and I, I, we've also seen at the same time, the gold price has been rising in an environment where it doesn't normally rise. So the environment we've got is the dollar has gone up. It's gone up from about 100 on the DXY, which is the, the, the dollar index. It's gone up from about 102. 203 to 106 now that's a three percent rise uh which normally is negative for the gold uh we've seen rising interest rates on the 10 year for example since um this december the uh just looking here the 10 year rate has risen from 3.8 percent to 4.6 percent nearly um so rising yields is usually bad for gold but the gold price has been rising uh so with the dollar up, interest rates up, gold should be going backwards, but instead it's been going forwards. Uh, for example, since October, gold is up from 1820-ish. Uh, we're now at, uh, well, I looked this morning, it was 2386. Uh, I think you just said it uh, was more like uh, 2400 this morning. Um, but gold has been very, very strong. It, you know, that we're talking about uh, 600, some, over $600 move. Um, in the space of three or four months. Uh, so what's happening? I think people are becoming more and more aware that the there is going to be a problem with the level of US debt. The government is not taking any action at the moment to uh, rein in its budget deficits or its deficits on, on the budget. Uh, so the level of American debt is going up with the prospect that interest rates aren't going to come down very quickly. We've we've had a few words out of the uh, Federal Reserve now saying that perhaps they're not going to reduce interest rates and maybe not even at all this year. Uh, that makes the funding of the US government debt it, to continue to be hard uh, because the interest rates they're paying are much higher than they paid over the last decade. And interest rates are going, uh, are, are costing the US taxpayer more and more. So, at, at the end of the day, there's some nervosity as to how long that can continue and whether it will create a crisis for the dollar at some point. Now, we're not saying that at the moment because the dollar is actually rising, but uh, people are sort of looking at their plan B, and plan B clearly is gold. Uh, and I think that's why money is flowing to gold. I mean, the the other thing which is going to gold is are the Chinese. Uh, we've got the Chinese central bank buying more gold than it's ever bought before. They're trying to play catch up with the USA. Uh, but we've got the Chinese consumer who's also buying gold. And the reason the Chinese consumers buy gold is because the traditional method of saving in China, which was buying houses and apartments, you buy a second or third apartment to rent out, uh, that's kind of gone out of the window because uh, there are now millions of these apartments which are sitting empty, can't be rented out anymore. And the building sector is in disarray because countless building companies have gone bust. So many, many Chinese who had invested in real estate via a building company, I they paid them to construct their uh, one of the apartments in a large block, are uh, now finding they've got a half-finished apartment with a bankrupt building company. So people are looking somewhere else than saving in real estate in China, uh, and they're not going to the stock market, which is the worst performing stock market in the world uh, in China and Hong Kong. So the, where, they, where are they going to? They're going to uh, three places. They're going to the uh, Chinese jewellery shops, shops, uh, there are tens of thousands of them all over China where the price of gold is pretty much priced bullion style, i.e. it's priced according to the weight plus a labor charge, but you know exactly where you stand there. Uh, and I can tell you that sales that I've been monitoring in the bullion chains are up typically 60% year on year. There might be a COVID effect in that, but certainly the sales are much, much higher than a year ago, which demonstrates that Chinese public are buying gold there. Uh, the second way they can buy gold is through their uh, WeChat app, where they can buy as little as one gram. One gram is very roughly $70, $80 worth of gold. So even the small buy guy can buy gold. And then we've got several, we've got over 10 million people who are buying gold through the Shanghai Gold Exchange, where the most popular bar is the 100 gram bar, 99.99% pure. And that's selling for about, uh, uh, I think it's seven thousand equivalent, equivalent about seven or eight thousand dollars. Yeah, that's uh, about so three point two ounces, isn't it? A hundred grams. 
yeah, uh, something like that, just over three ounces. Um, so pe people in China clearly are, are buying gold. And the, another thing to note is that the gold in Shanghai, on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, is trading at a small premium to the uh, price in the Western world. Uh, the premium was sort of 20 to 40 dollars. Um, the other day I saw it was trading at a 90 dollar premium, and I saw this morning it was trading at a 58 dollar premium. So it's trading at a little bit of more premium than usual over the spot gold price uh, here in the West, uh, which kind of means that uh, gold will be continue to be sucked out of the West and into into China, basically, because the Chinese public are wanting to earn more gold. So I think that's uh, that's a factor. Um, and of course, if you're in China, you perhaps don't want to put your money into the only alternative you've got, which is the digital renminbi, the equivalent of the CBDC, which is coming here in the West. So if you want something which is outside of the CBDC, gold seems to be a very good option for the Chinese. And I think that will come in the West sooner or later when we get the CBDC. Yeah, I, I guess the WeChat is similar to uh, having a, a Glint app, which uh, a lot of my viewers have, and uh, I'm affiliated with Glint. Uh, there, I think the the lease you can buy uh, is one pound or one dollar, so it's even less than a gram. Um, but uh, you, you just mentioned CBDC, and um, usually uh, prior to the last few years, where they've been talking about, you know, uh, CBDCs. Uh, when I, whenever I thought of a reset, I, I, I thought of a reset between, uh, like the financial assets and gold. And gold was the proxy for hard assets. So what I want to do now is bring up this uh, ratio here, uh, the Dow Gold ratio, uh, because it's really interesting. Uh, because I think it exemplifies the uh well it represents you know this sh the balance between uh paper assets you know stocks and bonds in general and hard assets i.e gold and this one goes back all the way to 18 uh, i think when the dow industrial average was uh created and uh, so this chart here for the viewers and for you as well clive uh, the higher uh, the, uh, the ratio, the, it means that the the more gold you need to buy stocks. So it means the more stocks are overvalued versus gold or money, if you want to call it. Because prior to to here uh, in the U.S., gold you know gold was money, A and then you have periods you know when the stock market booms, like here in the twenties, we topped in twenty nine, and then we, we have the crashes when things um, unwind, and then you have a buildup again, another crash, 1980, and then a buildup to, you know, you could argue that the top in the stock market was in the year 2000 in, in terms of money, because we haven't gone back above that level of 45. And uh, recently though, uh, you know, it has bounced stock market versus gold. But we're seeing quite a big drop this year because gold is up 16% in dollars and the Dow is virtually unchanged. And um, I used to always think, you know, the next time we see this ratio uh, around one or two, and if you go back in 1933, it got down to just below two. And in 1980, we got right around one. You know, that's what I'm expecting. I don't know uh, how, what the price of gold or the price of the Dow industrial average will be, but then it will probably be a good time to get, get out of your gold and buy some stocks. Um, what's your view on this kind of reset, uh, Clive? Well, uh, I'm kind of smiling because this kind of looks like the grand old Duke of York, you know, when they're up, they're up, when they're down, they're down, or when they're halfway up, they're neither up nor down. And that's where we are now. We are neither up nor down. Yeah, um, but uh, if we get to the level of one, uh, as you show on the graph, which is would be at the, at the bottom of the graph, uh, that would imply that either the gold price is considerably higher than where it is now, and I do think that's a likely scenario, or that stocks are considerably lower than where they are now, or a combination of the two. 
Um, and I, I, I certainly, I, I, I don't think I'm much of a bear on stocks, really. So I would rather go with the gold price rising faster than stocks. Uh, that would be the scenario I'd see. Well, I will get to your your ratio of one with that happening. So if, for example, uh, gold was to be uh, monetized just for the cash in circulation, uh, we'd certainly need a gold price around eight thousand dollars. But if it was to be monetized to cope with the amount of government debt, which is a promise to issue cash down the line, uh, if they were to promise it to uh, monetize it to the tune of about 30% of government debt, we'd need a price more like 80,000. Uh, well, we wouldn't need gold to get to 80,000 for your ratio to get to one to one, but uh, a much lower price would get that, get that number. But I, I do think that gold, uh, relative to many other things, is now in its element it's now performing it's performing better it's performing better than other things at the moment uh despite all the headwinds it's facing of higher interest rates and a higher dollar at the moment yeah and uh looking at this here you could even argue that we could even see uh one need less than an ounce of gold to to get a dow because you went from two to one and you could go to you know like minus yep. Um, yeah, I, I tend to think like you, I, I don't think they're going to let the stock market collapse because central bankers and politicians, they're still, and the general public for that matter, Clive, I think the majority of the public uh, unknowingly likes inflation. And why do I say that? Well, because they like uh, the government to provide for them. So you, you can't have that without inflating. So yeah, I, I could see uh, maybe the Dow at uh, sixty, and then you could go, you know, gold at uh, sixty thousand, or even if gold went to uh, thirty thousand with the Dow at sixty, it would still be two to one, which I, I think would be uh, pretty good. Uh, I would say for that uh, ratio, or we could see the Dow uh, as well, because you know if you look at here. Uh, in 1929, I think the Dow was around, got up to almost 400. And then it corrected down to like 40. And then uh, in the next uh, bull market, I think, uh, you know, even here, when we got here, the Dow was 800. So it, it still doubled from here. But the thing is, gold did a lot better. So... One could argue that we could see the Dow double and gold do a lot better. But uh, I think, uh, like you, it's going to be a combination of both. Uh, it's going to be the stock market going up, uh, but not as fast as gold. And we're starting to see that this year. You know, the funny thing is, when people look at the chart of gold, uh, they... And it's quite often the line is near the top of the chart, meaning gold is... Close at or close to an all time high. And, but if you look back in time, if you would have bought gold at any one of those moments in time when the chart was near the top, which is where we are today, it would have turned out to be a very good moment to buy gold because each top was succeeded by countless future all-time highs. Of course, we, we had our moments when it would have been cheaper to buy than a certain peak in the chart, but you could never tell when you look at a chart whether you're like the grand old Duke of York, whether you're just starting out from the bottom or whether you're halfway up or whether you're near the top. But you know that down the line, a few years from now, the top is going to be higher than it is at any moment in time. Yeah, you, you so need patience. I, 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 I encourage people not to sort of look at a chart and say, oh, my God, it's too high, uh, because you you know all the people who said that five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, have missed out on the rise. And the same thing applies to the stock market or any other asset you care today, which is tangible relative to cash. Yeah, I remember, you know, when I started buying gold, uh, it was around uh, 2002, and I bought it, it was uh, trading around $320. And then when it was arriving around 400, there's a lot of talk, which is around here, and a lot of talk about, oh, gold's too high, it's going to drop, you know, but uh, you just have to keep going. And I, I think the other thing as well, gold is like a currency and insurance. So, you know, you pay your insurance uh, policy every month. It's not like uh, 
you know, uh, you pay a one-off life insurance, you pay it every month. And I think it's the same thing with gold. Uh, gold is not something, oh, I'm going to buy it now because it's broken out and I want to make some profits and paper money. No, uh, you know, like, yeah, like you said, uh, Clive, just uh, buy whenever you can. But this is a long-term chart here of gold. And it actually goes back to 1833, which is interesting. So it was... Well, of course, in the early years, gold was the money, wasn't it? Yeah, so, gold was... And I'm not really sure why we're comparing with 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 a pound or the dollar, because yeah. it, was the, it, it was the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And as you can see there, for 100 years, from 1833 at least to eight, 1933, it was $20... You know, one ounce of gold was twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents. There was no price for gold, and this is when uh, Roosevelt uh, did his trick. You know, took all the gold and then revalued it to thirty-five <laughs> in nineteen thirty-four. But uh, he, and people say, oh, there's not enough gold at that price. Well, it, it all depends on the exchange rate between uh, gold and other. Uh, goods and services uh you know so it doesn't really the reason why we now have a, a price of gold is because it's not uh, yet we are under a, f a floating rate fiat currency system uh and uh, and that's i mean if if the usa would like to get back to sun money all it has to do is revalue gold at let's say eighty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars an ounce and then its currency could be fully backed by gold and it'll be able to meet its international obligations now that'll be fine as long as it doesn't continue to print more fiat cash yeah. uh you know and, and but as long as there's a fixed ratio between gold and uh and the dollar but yeah, 180 or hundred thousand dollars should be enough to yeah. enable them to have a very sound money system and once again be the powerhouse of the world with a, a currency you can rely on yeah i i think if you get it let's say to eighty thousand, what the Fed and the Treasury do at that point is that they have a band, and every time gold gets uh, too high, let's say to eighty thousand, eighty-one thousand, uh, they start, uh, you know, they'll start selling the gold with fiat, and every time it moves to like seventy-nine, they they start buying, you know, issuing fiat to buy the gold. So it's like they keep uh, this constant thing, but you have to have discipline to do that. You know, you have to, uh, you know, fiscal and monetary discipline. And I think uh, in the 80s, that's, you know, what happened de facto. I, I think gold was kind of fixed here uh, around $400. You see, it was like a band. It was only here in the late 90s that it dropped. Uh, but uh, right now it's very uh, the dollar is very unstable. But I think what this will do, unless they really hyperinflate the currency, it's that is going to give uh, America and the world a, a little bit of a, a leeway to keep going in this currency system. And uh, I drew this line here, Clive, um, and uh, I I can't really move it down the chart to see where the gold price would meet but it, as you can see it's a lot higher you know and it looks like we could go back towards this line here that was broken yeah um i i i think it's great fun to draw lines on charts but uh the the reality is things could move all over the place then you have to move your line to make it match uh, yeah. that's the that's the funny thing but uh it, i take i'm certainly with you mario the way it looks to me is gold is coming back into favor a little bit but i don't think it's really speculative at all at the moment i think it's uh, just the very very beginning um i think more and more people will start to put some gold in their portfolio as you say for insurance purposes so uh, traditionally in switzerland we would always have somewhere between zero and three percent of gold maybe something went to five um i think that number will be moving up in switzerland to perhaps five percent now and i think uh in other countries where they didn't do that so much i certainly think gold will start to be part of the asset allocation of portfolios yeah and i, I i'm just going to bring this up here i saw the other day from tavi costa 
uh, he likes doing a lot of the charts and uh, relative value. Let's have a look here, show you this. This is quite telling. Uh, here we go. So gold and gold miners is a percentage of total global assets. And uh, I mean, this is going back to 1921. Uh, and uh, we're only at 1% in 2024. And you can see my comment there. <laughs> Oh, you commented, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can see, you can see it. It says, uh, I don't know if you can scroll that, but if not, uh, it says you'll oh. never make a lot of money chasing the crowd. Yeah, yeah. You're better oh, off if the crowd is chasing you. Yeah. So in gold terms, if you're going to go now, the crowd will be chasing you. Yeah, yeah. But it just goes to show as well, even if you just get, you know, 5 or 10% of global assets, uh, you know, put into gold, and gold miners, you you can do really well. What if you know if you revert back to what what it has been historically, you know around twenty to thirty uh, percent. There's a huge potential there. Uh, gold miners have been a massive underperformer relative to the gold price of the last decade. Uh, gold, well, I say last decade, last last few years, let's say, gold has been creeping up and the gold miners have been going downwards although they've had a little bit of a bump in the last few months but realistically speaking there's a lot of catch-up that the gold miners have to have to do to get back to the prices that they were last time gold was at two thousand mm. dollars so there's a long long way up and anyone who wants to check that can check it by looking on if they go to one of their graph charting applications look at the price of gdx that's the uh, one of the gold mining ETFs. It owns the large gold mining stocks. And if you look at the chart of that, you'll see that on the long-term chart, it's way below where it could be. Um, so if you think you've missed buying gold, which looks like for some people it's at the all-time high, it's not at the high, the future high, but it's at the high from um, in the past, you can see that the gold miners are a long, long, long way below the all-time high, and they've got a long way to go up. Yeah, so I guess uh, what you're saying is, yeah, maybe buy a little bit of gold, uh, but also if you feel like you've missed the boat, <laughs> the you know the uh, minor boat is still uh, around. I don't think it's even left the shore yet. No, uh, I'm I'm actually bringing this up. Hold on, uh, GDX. I think I can do a ratio of it too. Uh, so let's share this. So here we go. It's the price of gold versus the GDX. So this was in 2011 uh, when the miners did quite well. And now this means that gold has done too, really well and that this chart could go down. So it's the gold divided by the G GDX. Yeah, so what, what that basically says, looking at your chart, is that uh, gold the, uh, gold has risen three times uh, relative to the gold miners. Uh, so... Yeah, since there, gold... There's a possible... If, even if gold stands still, there's a possibility of the gold miners tripling to get to fair value, put it, other, put it that way. All right. Um, what else is on your mind, Clive, in terms of what's important for, uh, you know, in terms of, let's say, the central banks, you know, are they worried? I mean, even the IMF now is warning about, you know, the debt and deficit spending, um, you know. The okay, so well, obviously, one of the things which is playing a lot on investor minds is the direction of interest rates, which up until about a few weeks ago was largely seen as perhaps we'll have three US cuts this year. Um, that's gradually going out of the window to the point that some people are saying the next change in interest rates in the United States might be upwards. Of course, that's not going to happen anytime soon, uh, especially not in, a, in an election year. Uh, but the Federal Reserve is not... <clears throat> The Federal Reserve is not getting what it wants in terms of inflation, i.e. inflation is no longer heading towards 2%. It's heading away from 2%. So they haven't got that 
uh, to, to help them lower rates. And the employment numbers, which is the other thing they're looking at, have proved to be very robust. The US economy is proving to be strong. So on those gr- on both of those grounds, on, on neither of those grounds, can they lower interest rates? So if this continues, the, the, the talk will start about whether rate, the next move in rates will be higher rates rather than lower rates. Now, that's interesting because the talk in Europe is still about lower rates. Uh, it's widely expected that the European Central Bank will reduce their rates next, and it, therefore we'll have a, a, a widening divergence between the US dollar uh, rates and the European rates. Uh, and I don't really know what that will do, but obviously from a currency perspective, it, it, it plays into the strong dollar hand. Um, another thing which is perhaps going on for international investors to keep an eye on, um, tomorrow we have the halvening of the Bitcoin. What does that mean? It doesn't mean half the price nor half the number of Bitcoins. It means half of the number of Bitcoins produced every 10 minutes. So up until now, uh, every, so every four years, the number of Bitcoins which can be manufactured by mining uh, and this is a mathematical formula; it can't be changed by humans. Uh, were six and a quarter, uh, six and a half bitcoin. I think it's a quarter. Bit, yeah, six and a quarter bitcoins every ten minutes. That number will drop to three and one eighth bitcoins every ten minutes as of tomorrow, and then in another four years it will halve again. So, uh, those who are interested in that uh, alternative gold, as some see it, uh, might want to know that the supply of bitcoins will be falling and another thing we've got going on in about we, we've had approval in hong kong for the bitcoin spot etfs which are in a way more interesting than the us etfs because the us etfs are ca- basically cash settled whereas the ones in hong kong can be physically settled and they will come out and uh, be launched i think some sometime in the next 10 days uh which be, means that people will actually be able to deliver in bitcoin or withdraw Bitcoin, uh, just as the way ETFs work in America for shares, where you can deliver in shares or get the shares shares out if you have a sufficient size, which is not the case at the moment for the Bitcoin ETFs. So there's a little bit going on in the Bitcoin uh, space. Um, I'm not going to make any price predictions here other than to say there's things going on in Bitcoin, which people want to keep an eye on. Uh, but I would say that if you have no Bitcoin you probably want to learn how what safe custody is because, uh, like gold, Bitcoin is a asset which you could have, which is outside the control of your government if the government becomes very oppressive. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't talk much about Bitcoin, but I have in the past years ago, and that's what I used to tell people. If you want to have some Bitcoin, don't keep it in an exchange <laughs> because it's actually not there, really. It's just a, a number. If you want to have real Bitcoin, have it in your private wallet. And uh, interesting about Hong Kong, and many people think Hong Kong is part of China, but technically it's like an autonomous region because in China, from what I've heard, uh, Bitcoin, uh, it's not legal to have Bitcoin. Is that right, Clive? Uh, Yeah, Bitcoin was made illegal a few years ago in China, uh, although I think that's... uh... A fudge because that, there's understood to be many Chinese Bitcoin miners, uh, so I'm not quite sure where the law lies. But yeah. certainly, it's ab- it's absolutely legal in Hong Kong, and uh, one of the major uh, Chinese banks, which is also a British bank, I, I won't mention its name, is proposing to launch uh, the ability for their customers to buy Bitcoin through the bank, uh, yeah. one of the largest banks in the world. Uh, but Hong Kong makes you guess which one it is. Well, yeah. I'll say it. I'll say that. The Opium Bank. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, so that's going on. And of course, uh, with the launch of the Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin spot ETF, uh, ETF on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, that will draw in Chinese money. So even if you can't uh, trade Bitcoin directly in China, you can still go abroad to the Hong Kong uh, exchange and buy your Bitcoin ETF if you want to that way. Uh, I suppose uh, most Chinese people won't do that because they'll say it's too complicated. The Hong Kong dollar is a foreign currency to me. Uh, it's difficult and it's a long way away. But there'll certainly be some demand coming out of China too. Uh, but I, I think most of the, a lot of the demand will come out of Asia in general to uh, get into Bitcoin that way. Yeah. All right. Uh, 
But just one more thing, uh, Clive, uh, I was talking to you about uh, this uh, basis trade, a and I remember the basis trade well. I mean, it's basically uh, as a futures broker for 20 years, it's when you uh, you, you buy, you, you buy uh, let's say, the future and you sell the underlying and... Uh, and you, the basis is the difference between in price between of the security when it's delivered and the security now. Usually, there's a little a discrepancy, and it was a boring trade back when I was in the markets. Very few people did basis trades, but it seems now that the hedge funds are getting heavily involved, and you need a lot of leverage uh, to do the basis trade to make it worthwhile. Uh, it, 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 on paper, it's not risky. But when the liquidity in the cash bond market and in the futures market gets uh, difficult, when a, a lot of the uh, these hedge funds, when they buy the cash bonds, they, they borrow it through the repo market. A lot of times, if they don't get that delivered, uh, they're naked, long or short the future, and, and it could be a huge problem. And even the IMF now is warning about that, uh, you know, the regulators. And then that hedge funds could be too big to fail, which, which seems outrageous because, you know, why should the man on the street uh, bail out hedge funds? But I would argue that the, the people who fund the hedge funds, though, are the banks where most of you keep your money. So I uh, just wanted to put that out there uh, and get your two cents on that, Clive. So normally futures should trade at a price which is equivalent to the spot price plus the cost of carry, which is for something like gold, it would be the interest rate. Uh, or if it's a two currencies, it would be the interest rate differential between the two currencies. Uh, and the minute there's any discrepancy, it's kind of normal that arbitrageurs, which in the modern day and age is mostly hedge funds, would step in and arbitrage away the difference by buying one and selling the other. And as you say, Mario, in theory, that's a completely risk-free trade, except that it's not a risk-free trade because things can get out of kilter big time. In other words, the spread, which should be arbitraged away, may get to a point where it's not being arbitraged away. And then the person who's uh, holding the future, either long or short, depending which direction he's going, might find that he's getting margin calls, which he can't actually meet. So he is then forced into panic mode, which is unwinding his position, which forces the spread to get wider, not narrower, exacerbating the situation. And when we have a... So this shouldn't be a problem in an orderly market. But if we have a situation where there's been a lurch in the exchange rate or a lurch in the gold price or a lurch in interest rates, I a bigger move than expected, there will be guaranteed someone at the wrong end of it and they're going to lose money and they're going to make the headlines. Will they be too big to fail or will they be too big? Um, that remains to be seen. We know, you never, when, when something fails, you never get a day's warning saying, oh, they're going to fail next week uh, or next month. It, it, it happens when it happens. Um, so, but, you know, you when you're dealing with financial institutions, always bear in mind, how would I feel if there's an event which causes me not to be able to lay my hands on my assets at the financial institution. And that's why you don't want to be holding everything in one place. You need to be have your assets in multiple places and always have something that you can access from home without the permission of your bank or your government. Great. Uh, and Clive, before we uh, wrap up, could you tell the viewers where they can reach you and communicate yep. with you? So uh, thank you very much, Mario. I'm, uh, I'm retired. I don't sell any services. Uh, I don't have anything to, to, to sell. Uh, but I write on LinkedIn for pleasure because I enjoy writing. I've been writing for, for 30 or 40 years to my clients when I was working in wealth management. And now I'm retired. I continue to do that, uh, but publish my articles on LinkedIn and everybody's free to read them. It's a kind of uh, fun thing to do, but if you enjoy... Uh, my discussions about equities, about stocks, about uh, gold, about Bitcoin, about property, about the Federal Reserve. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn and you'll get a chance to read my articles. 
Yeah, and that's Clive Thompson, for those of you who haven't seen Clive before. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks for your time, Clive, and uh, I wish you a, a great weekend. Thank you very much, Mario. To all your listeners, don't forget to give Mario the thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you, Clive.